like, hey, you know, I fuck such and such, right? So it's something up. Something's going on. I think he framing me or something, anything. And also, too, where the who the hell's blood was that going down to the neighbor's loft and in the painting? Whose skull fragments was in the painting? If Heidi was alive, what's going on? Who died? Who was killed? And all of this to become mayor of Chicago? Nigga. Welcome, welcome. This is the Simply King Podcast. It's your boy Rodney Perry King himself. And you just tuned into another, another edition of the Soulfully Conscious Podcast for Humans, Simply Being Humans. And today I'm back here in the living room, giving you another solo episode. So you know what that means. It's gonna be an informative one and an entertaining one. Uh um, I didn't mean for this particular Next solo episode, it was very unintentional. This is a very impromptu recording, if you will. But it was so much going on that here I am doing another solo episode about dating, about love, about relationships, about the things. It's too much going on. It's way too much going on. It's way too much going on. If you don't know, you should know. I'm Rodney Perry, also known as King. Um... Been doing this for almost eight years and counting. We're coming up on nine years in fall of doing the Simply King podcast. Uh, and it's been hell of a ride. Hell of a ride. If anything, I've been so inspired by the recent events of one of the, you know, what I like to think as, you know, our four mother and and, and forefather in, um, in podcasting, our, you know, forever fake cousins in our head. The Reed podcast, being able to meet Beyonce, which if you know the Reed, you know, Beyonce is very much it's it's Beyonce coded. If they could just have a whole podcast about Beyonce, they would. But they take time to talk about other things. And um, personally, I was genuinely inspired by, you know, them being actually called in by her team, by Beyonce's team into the sacred launch event. And um, being just given that whole treatment, like it makes you really think like if you stay down, and you stay loyal to what it is that you are and who you are. The right things are going to happen for you. The right things are going to happen. Um, and it's so inspiring as a podcaster to see that happen to people who genuinely, genuinely deserve it. Um, but today we are talking about a little bit of everything. We're going to I'm going to tell you how I feel about Mia Culpa. We're going to talk about Risa Tisa. We're going to talk about how Tinder and Hinge have a class action lawsuit for predatory practices. And also, too, I'm going to give you the strategy for the last roster you will ever need and have in dating. It's the last strategy you will need. More than likely, this will yield a partner of some sort. Bear with me. We're about to get into it. This is Simply King. (laughs) <laughs> so let's get into the vibe minute the vibe minute is brought to you by my accompanying other venture um called the vibe hour which is my own kind of radio inspired musical experience that i host on station head every tuesday and thursday at 9 p.m eastern standard time and this is my way of letting you know and kind of keeping you in the vibes of the vibe hour by giving you the vibe minute and today's vibe minute question is what is the song or songs if you want to the rom-com about your love life for me it's honestly anything alex isley and the first thing that came to mind was something that's the contents of the song are not that you know loving it's almost kind of about the 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 separation of love, if you will, but you know, rom-coms, you, you make, you break, whatever. But I would have to say for sure, I want my love life to sound like good and plenty because I got good and plenty love around here. You feel me? Say you Let me know in the comments. Let me know in 
um, reply, stitch it, whatever you, wherever you see this at, let me know what your song is for your rom-com. If it was, you know, a rom-com about your love life. And that's today's five minute. Okay. Now let's get even deeper into the things. Let's talk about Risa. Let's talk about Risa. So the newest real world soap opera that has truly encapsulated a story of of lies, deceit, um, stolen identities, love, lost of love, and home ownership. I'm talking about none other than Risa Tisa. Risa Tisa has published out a story, a TikTok story that is 50 parts of the main story, 20 additional parts of a live talk back, if you will. It has garnered her over, people are saying uh, over 200 million, which I don't know if those numbers are, con, you know, congruent, but it's crazy. It's taken the world by storm. The woman has now been, you know, gifted with trips to London and Paris, BMWs, rental vehicles while she is, you know, traveling international. Um, she's been accepted into the creator fund, kicked out of the creator fund on TikTok, um, has been talked about all over the internet uh, from, from, from everywhere and in between. And I think that uh, my key takeaways from this overall story of this very, very, admittedly so, um, desperate black woman who was genuinely just in a pursuit of love. Um, and a man by the name of Legion Jerome, I don't know his last name, had to take advantage of this woman for some reason. I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. I don't know what the hell his, uh, you know, mental affliction may be, but it's stupid. It was a very, like, it doesn't make sense as to why anybody would, lie, habitually lie to this degree, um, lie on other people's lives to this degree. Like lying about who you are is one thing, but this nigga told, this nigga put death on somebody, kids, this nigga impersonating his twin brother. He lying about the money he got. He lying about the job he possess. For what? What exactly do you gain from this? Genuinely some ass. You did all this for some butt? Can't be. You did all this for some love, some attention? Couldn't be. It's crazy. And I think before I even get into, you know, the biggest of things, I think the thing that I haven't heard enough people talk about is that Legion has to have issues himself for him to even seek out women who might see him as a suitable person. Um, Mind you, they're not really seeing him as a suitable person because he's making up who he is. <laughs> but you got to be fucked up. It's something got something to be wrong with you. And I think he can, because that's who he really is, he's certainly relating and attracting people who have a, now I won't even say a similar sense of sensibility of, and self-esteem as him, but more than anything, they, 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 they're, they're insecure. He's insecure. So he can sense insecurity in other people, hence him preying on these types of women. He's gotten married three times and he's exploiting all these women's lives and using their lives to, to, to aid in another lie for another lie for another lie. But here are my key takeaways from, uh, from Risa Tisa's story. Dating in, in Atlanta is a wasteland <laughs> for love for a lot of people. And um, I understand why. And it's crazy because I think the potentiality that you have in Atlanta to be this cute ass couple that everybody would love to emulate. <laughs> it's kind of right there. So much of Atlanta. I don't know about y'all who live in Atlanta and people who frequent here often for work or whatever. There's so many things you could take your girl or a girl you trying to impress to. It's a lot of places where it's like, this is not for the guys. This is, and I wouldn't even be surprised. If some of the girls are like, yeah, this is cute. But I'd rather be here with a nigga. I'd rather be here with a, with a person I'm trying to date. Not even just a nigga, just a person I'm trying to date. 
because so many things are really romantic. It, it's so many things in Atlanta are just made for two. You know what I'm saying? Just made for you and yours. You know, like from the from the gaming, from the adult gaming places, a bunch of those. From the cute activities that feel like something you would do with yours, making candles and 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 you know different little courses and classes and you know escape the bomb, solve the puzzle, beat the this, the, the, ah, everything. It's so much of that. But if you can't get that, what does it feel like? And I think that that's what makes it feel somewhat of like a wasteland. And I think that that's how you get to a person like Risa Tisa, even getting to a point of desperation. You already have this overall pressure that's put on women from a societal context. Then you bring it down to the subculture of Atlanta being this quote unquote black Mecca where there are black women on a day to day basis, making their own money, getting their own things and quote unquote unbeknownst to her, unbeknownst to us, finding the men of their dreams that they are equally yoked with. That's making enough money. That's not asking too much of them. That's treating them exactly how they want to be treated. But this is the most extreme example to me of a scarcity mindset. I think so much of her ignoring the red flags of Legion's, you know, proclamations and, you know, of who he is, has so much to do with her wanting what she wanted. She wanted, she wanted a man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I have to find uh, what his full screen name is, but shout out to my best friend Lou for sending this over to me, this creator by the name. I think he goes by Teddy something. And he was just like, uh, he was like, Legion a big stepper. <laughs> Legion a big stepper because Legion was paying them bills. So she didn't ask too many questions. She didn't, she didn't push past the questions that she asked because he was paying all them bills. You paying all the bills, you can do what you want. And I think that that is a like, and even though it's simple and it's silly to think of it that way, that did do a lot. That did a lot. If Legion wasn't paying bills, I could imagine she was going to be like, oh, hold the hell up. Who are you? What's going on? But the fact that he was <laughs> on top of also laying something down, we know he was doing that, too. Here we are. Here we are. It's funny to me. It's funny to me. But I think that we can figure out a better way to kind of approach this, um, because I think having a scarcity mindset, if you genuinely believe that it's not enough men out here, um, then you're setting yourself up to not find that person, to end up settling. You're setting your mind, your mental, your spiritual, your emotional to basically bring down your standards when you have a scarcity mindset. And just now you're at the bar. You're at the lowest point of acceptance of a person in your life. He just got to be kind. I just want somebody nice. I just want somebody to listen to me. I just want somebody to just be there and act like they're not going nowhere. Act like they like being here with me. Bare minimum things. That's what comes when you have a scarcity mindset. When you believe that it's only a handful of men out there that are really out there for you that can potentially be your person. But also, too, because I think I understand we as men, we have to do a lot of work. We got to get a lot of shit together. We got to start doing the work in a major, major way. But I also believe that we got to also understand and get aligned on certain things. I know for a fact so many women feel the exact same ways. What? What truly fortifies the idea of even having a scarcity mindset is so many women feel within themselves that they have work to do. So they they make space and give grace to the things that people don't really have going on for themselves. So Legion can show, a nigga like Legion can show up half ass because you might feel like you might not be fully where you want to be as whoever you are. And I think that's where Risa Tisa was. Risa felt I, I'm projecting, I'm kind of analyzing thing, but we all are at this point about her life. That is a part, I think that was a part of it. You know, like she, she, this thing she's trying to figure out in life, this thing she's trying to work on. He's presenting that he is a certain type of person, but if he does have these flaws or these shortcomings in these ways, she can make space for him. But as I said before, red flags are red flags. We're going to talk even more about that later. I did a whole episode called Red, Yellow, and Green Flags. Please go back and listen to that one. 
please go back and watch that one because it's necessary to overall to the overall understanding of how we need to look at these things. If you see a red flag in somebody, stop. You know what your red flags are. And if you don't know, you should know. Meditate on it. Yellow flags are the things that you can possibly get a little bit more information, have a conversation. These things can change and shift and not even be anything negative and not affect the relationship as it progresses. But if somebody, you see a red flag, it's time to stop. It's time to be done with it. It's time to let it go, let it out, leave it alone. That's it. That's it. That's it. And lastly, um, sidelining your judgment for the sake of being chosen is never the, the idea or the goal. You deserve to have a love that feels good no matter what, no matter where you where you are. You know what I'm saying? Like you need to feel like you don't need to 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 invite this new love into your life, but also hold in the back of your mind and the front of your mind that this might come with a little bit more than you than you than you really signed up for. Because you're gonna sigh, you're gonna you gonna you know what? It may not be that deep. It may not be that deep. It, it might be okay. It, it might not affect me later. And it's like, mm, okay, you've seen it though. And he showed you who he was. Now what are you gonna do? So wishing the best for Risa Tisa. Um, I hope that, you know, she, I think if anything with this new found fame, I don't know, I hope it makes it even easier <laughs> for, for her to find the love of her life when she finally is ready to get back there in the dating world. Cause I can imagine she probably ain't too quick to get it back into it. But um, certainly I think she probably is gonna approach it in the most wisest ways. I hope that she's, you know, sitting down talking to the lady and healing from all the things that she's been through and I hope that this was a big part of the process and a, a, a uplifting part of the process because it's just her standing in her own testimony, telling her story was a beautiful thing. But moving on from Risa Tisa, um, this is something that was sent to me. Shout out to my, uh, my friend Elena who sent this over to me because it's intriguing. And I think a lot of people have been posting things and complaining about dating apps for quite some time now. And I'll read from a article posted by the by NPR dot org. Uh, the headline says maker of Tinder hinge sued over addictive dating apps that put profits over love. OK, um, the popular dating apps, Tinder hinge and the league hook users with the promise of seemingly endless romantic matches in order to push people to pay money to continue their compulsive behavior, according to a federal lawsuit filed in San Francisco on Wednesday. And I'll continue. The suit brought up by six plaintiffs in states, including New York, California, and Florida, argues that dating app parent company Match Group gamifies the services to transform users into gamblers locked in a search for psychological rewards that Match makes elusive on purpose. Mm. While Hinge's advertising slogan boasts that it is designed to be deleted, the lawsuit claims match groups dating apps are really designed to turn users into addicts who do not find true love and instead keep purchasing subscriptions and other paid perks to keep the publicly traded company rev company's revenue flowing. The complaint, which is seeking class action status, claims Match Group has violated state and federal consumer protection, false advertising and effective design laws. Harnessing powerful technologies and hidden algorithms, Match intentionally designs the platform with addictive game like design features, which locks users into perpetually pay to pay loop that prioritizes corporate profits over its marketing promises and customers relationship goals. Lawyers for the plaintiffs wrote in the suit. Damn. I don't know if y'all been on these apps. I know I have. Um, they are interesting. Certainly interesting um, because you can feel like they are, you know, at least presenting to you that there are people out here who look like your type, look like your speed, uh, that are ready for love. I think Hinge to me was the first time I ever really downloaded a dating app and actually got excited because of the, the make of Hinge, you know, the prompts and 
and it feeling like, you know, you kind of had an icebreaker um, It feeling like there were, you know, it felt kind of equitable, and, you know, unlike Bumble, where you had to they had to say something to you first. They made it into this whole thing. Like if you match with people, they never respond. OK, cool. It is what it is. You never can. You can't even go back to it and see them again. They, they just never respond. It just is what it is. You know, um, they have to match with you to start that conversation. I like that element. And that's kind of always been an element of all all of them. But it felt like it just felt a little easier. It just felt a little easy. I went on. I've been on a lot of dates, met a lot of people um, from just Hinge specifically. No, I've been on one Tinder date. That's a story for another time. Probably have told it before on another podcast. Um, but she's still good people. And I know she I think she found love. So shout out to her. Nevertheless, I think and believe that these practices, these things that are existing for these day naps are so, 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 so dastardly. You know, it makes sense because so many people are speaking to like the quality of things I know on Hinge. And I know for all of them, they have these separate uh, entities where they these separate features where they have these quote unquote on Hinge, they call them standouts where these standouts look obviously better than the, the general admission swipes that you get. So it's like, hold on. So you know what I like. You're showing me people that look good to me, but I can only send them a rose. I can't just match with a few of these people. I can't do that. Mm, I don't like that. 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 But it is what it is. And I believe that this class action lawsuit is pretty much going to get it done. I don't know what white woman got scarred off this thing, but I'm glad that they said something. Mm hmm. Yep, I'm saying it. I, I know we all thought it. We all thought it. But let's chat about Love is Blind. Season six features several different couples. The couple that I think most people are in conversation with are the ones who have. It's honestly been kind of boring to me. Like some of the a lot of the scenes or a lot of the couples compatibility and chemistry is actually kind of lackluster. So I'm not going to say too much about the whole group. Because I feel like so many people is really not much to say, but I'm gonna give you what my what I feel like my key points are. Um, for one, when AD was still in the pods, her falling for the you know the dude that every other woman kind of didn't really see it for. To me, I think that she just was really just not used to having a man that was expressive in any way, shape, or form. Um, I think that she more than likely is used to being overly sexualized. Uh, she looks great. She looks good. It was a lot of conversation around AD's body and everything like that, not only around the show, but also in the in the show itself, um, which I thought was intriguing, which I thought was interesting. Um, Clay could potentially, you know, be a good person for her. Um, I think as I was watching it when they were in um, Mexico, when they were on this trip, Clay and AD had this weird moment where he kind of zoned out and I and it was triggering because I related to it so much. I've been there. I've done that. I've, I've been that person where I allow myself, I allow the, the negative and the, allow something negative or allow something, you know, indifferent to come into my mind instead of enjoying the moment with this person that I'm with. And that confuses the shit out of the other person. It confuses the shit out of the other person. I think that him showing up that way only is going to create more issues. So he got to nip that in the bud. He got to do the work. He got to look in deeper. He got to learn how to be present and block out these thoughts. Because the fact of the matter is, it's not presenting the best version of yourself. And now you're going to be having to fight what you really feel versus how you show up. Because what you feel, what you're showing up as is that you are disinterested, that you are not there, like there's something missing, like there's something that's not keeping your interest. Like it feels like so many things to your person and it's going to confuse them and make them really genuinely shut you out eventually and emotionally detached because they feel unsettled and unsafe with you. And I hope that that, that doesn't happen with, with Clay and AD. I hope the best for them. Um, lastly, um, Kenneth's behavior was unacceptable. I know bro is like 24, 25 years old, but he's a principal of a school and he's behaving like a, to me, I feel like he behaved like a child. Like that was very teenager like for her to voice an issue that she had with him 
And for him to show up in a way of, oh, I'm going to just do whatever. I'm going to just say, I'm going to just look at my phone and be like, well, I guess guess this ain't going to work out. As if this ain't a television show, as if this ain't a whole production, as if y'all just didn't spend a whole week together and then a, a whole nother, you know, you know, a whole nother span of time getting to know each other just via the pods and you were showering her with all this affection and attention and and, and and selling a real interesting dream for you to then be in person and be so detached, be so disinterested. This is already the first white woman that you ever dated. And I ain't, look, I was mad because he made me have to defend her. Cause I already was, I was already in the in the mind of like, I hope this don't end up being one of them weird like, we don't know if her, we don't know if her family gonna accept him type of things. I would hate that for him, right? Cause this was set in North Carolina this year, for this season. So to me, it was a lot of things going on, but nevertheless, it is what it is. I think that Kenneth should have behaved differently, and I think that it was really weird and telling that that was how he decided to show up in my mind. And all the white people are, you know, lackluster. I don't know if any of them are going to genuinely make it to the altar or past the altar. And this yet again might be another season where the only couple that genuinely might make it through is the black couple for real. That's just what I think. But let's move on to Mia Copa. <laughs> so I started this series on TikTok that I like to call the boomerang effect. And it's inspired, uh, certainly directly inspired by the Bechdel test and the Bechdel test being a kind of, you know, movie review, critical analysis of film where you assess the use and the purpose of the female characters or femme characters within a film. Um, And to quickly explain for the Bechdel test, you, I believe you for one have to have, you know, Female characters, I believe, in scenes by themselves, um, they actually need to have spoken parts. Um, and when they and they they actually interact with each other, there's more than one woman in the scene. And when they do interact with each other, uh, if there, there needs to be more than one woman in the scene. And if they do interact with each other, it's not about the men um, in the movie as well. Like they actually have just their own banter about things outside of the men in the movie to not just be seen as accessories and just, you know, they're actually full characters within the film um, and just full people within the film. So for me, I came up with the boomerang test. Obviously it's kind of inspired, it's definitely directly inspired by the boomerang movie. I think it's one of the best rom-coms, not even just black rom-coms, just best rom-coms to ever be created. Um, And I think what I love about it the most is that it created this beautiful world of blackness where the use of whiteness and the presence of whiteness was honestly not that necessary, but was still used as a comedic device um, and just was a quality story. So for you to pass the boomerang effect test, if you will, you got to pass all three. You need authentic blackness to be present within the, in the, within it. You need authentic blackness to be uh, present within it. You need um, not only authentic blackness, you need the use and the presence of whiteness. Um, Like judging the use and the presence of whiteness. How did they use it? What is it? What is it doing? Um, And a quality store. That's it. Simple, right? But everybody doesn't pass, which goes to the movie of <laughs> the movie for this particular boomerang effect. So Mia Culpa's boomerang effect, I'll let you know right now, they did not pass and I'll tell you why. For Mia Culpa featuring Kelly Rowland, Trevante Rhodes, produced, written, and directed by Tyler Perry Studios and Tyler Perry specifically. To me, when it comes to authentic blackness, uh, I think I think they pass in this category. They pass in this particular, you know, segment. Um, Trevante truly represents an artsy Chicago man. You know what I'm saying? Like he uh, he lives in a loft, probably in like you know South Loop or something. You know what I'm saying? He 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 
He's artsy. He lives above a damn sex club. You feel me? Like it's given that for sure. For sure. Uh, the black uh, the black gallery owner. Uh, Chicago has a really, really rich um, black art scene. They, there's a lot of very historical black artists that are born and raised in Chicago and still very much are present within those artistic spaces. Um, and a lot of different modern contemporary artists that are from Chicago as well. Shout out to Edo. Shout out to, uh, to um, I forgot what Mia's last name is. Mia something, Mia something. I can't remember. Ah, but so many people, so many, so many people. Um, and also like Hebrew Brantley for instance. Um, so, so there's a lot of contemporary artists that are very well known. So I think them having a black gallery owner as a character within it um, was perfect. Um, their reference to me and their references to modern black art as well um, as a kind of from a celebrity culture context, I think was a really dope way to kind of display that and something that really is genuinely going to make sense um, in today's world and be very relatable to how we see art as artists can be celebrities again. Cause I feel like there was a time where they kind of weren't as much. Um, and I think right now you can be an artistic celebrity yet again, um, as in the times of, you know, the Basquiat's and the Warhols and stuff. Then the use and the presence of whiteness. The mother was a weird villain. She was a weird villain. She was loud. She was a loud tertiary character that I thought was kind of like, I don't know. I feel like they didn't. She didn't deserve the amount of relevance that she got in the film. In my opinion, it just was mid. It was mid to me. It, it, it didn't. It didn't. I don't feel like I got enough from that. I don't feel like they built her up enough. Like yeah, they gave us that she hated her, but it was given just racism. Like, and she got these two black sons. It was strange. It was stretched. It was forced. And I understand it being something that could potentially be realistic to some degree. Like there are probably men who happen to be biracial, who happen to be mama's boys and marry black women and their moms hate them. But like, what are we saying, Tyler? What are we trying to say? What are we putting black women through that they were that they chose and were chosen by these biracial men who mother is this monster in law? Come on now. Like her being kind of the mastermind and the person kind of behind kind of, you know, pushing all the buttons and devising all these like conniving schemes and plans to to basically torture and punish these black women that they chose to be with was strange strange i don't know what we i don't know what really is being said about what's, what's really really going on um and then the quality of story to me it's a fail complete fail there's holes everywhere for one if the da's wife actually slept with the Zaire character being played by Trevante Rhodes, which the DA's wife was played by Shannon uh, Thornton, Miss Mississippi, you know. How did we get here? How does, how, because these things are public information. Him having a wife who his wife is, the fact that his, that we, we he would have known and been definitely informed that who, the defend who his lawyer is is actually directly connected and related to the DA in some way, shape, or form. So there would there should have been a conversation. There should have been said more said, and maybe y'all could tell me where where it was pointed out. But in my mind, Zaire could have told Mia what was going on. Like, hey, you know I fuck such and such, right? So it's some uh, something's going on. I think he's framing me or something, anything. And also to where the who the hell's blood was that going down to the neighbor's loft and in the painting, whose skull fragments was in the painting? If Heidi was alive, what's going on? Who died? Who was killed? And all of this to become mayor of Chicago? Nigga. That's a lot. That's a lot. It ain't never that deep. It ain't never that deep to be a district. Like you going from district attorney to mayor, like you just ain't gonna win. Your mama faking cat. Strange, strange. P fail, 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 fail. That's just simply put. That's just simply what it is. Now let's get into the last uh, segment of this episode, and it's what I would like to introduce as the last roster. 
your last roster, the last stra- your last roster strategy is what I'm liking to call this. Let's get into it. So the idea around the last roster is a concept that I came up with quite some time ago. And it's something that I'm going to follow. So I'm not just projecting this on y'all as something to do, but also something that I'm going to do in the dating world, in the dating game, if you will. Um, And I want everybody to understand, you need to roster date. You need to date more than one person. You believe that you don't. I'm not telling you to do the most intimate, vulnerable thing with 10, 11 people. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you need to have more than one person in your basket. Do not put your eggs in one basket because you like them. Do not do that. You should like people. You should be dating people you like. You should be entertaining people you actually enjoy. You should not have waste men, waste women in your life, wasting your time. They need to bring some sense of something to your life. So you have these particular four roles that should be occupied in your roster. And I'll break them all down individually. They are the buffer, the playmate, the contender, and the champion. Let's start with the buffer. The buffer, the length of connection can really be around one to four weeks. You know, um, the current purpose of the connection can be something as simple as somebody that's passing the time. A lot of people are going to start off as buffers. You don't know them. You're still getting to know them. You're collecting information um, and you're trying to figure out if they can be reclassified into something deeper. Maybe you can keep getting to know them and get and they can move to a different role or they might stay being a buffer for, you know, until you until you realize that this is somebody that you should let go because they don't really serve no other purpose other than just a good little conversation every now and again which plenty of people are going to be buffers. Then you have the playmate. The playmate being a person that you actually have found at least one singular interest in. The length of connection can be one week to two months. Because let's say y'all, you know, met and y'all both have an affinity for hiking. You both have an affinity for fitness. You both have an affinity for food. And you just like to kind of, you know, share these things. Um, There's still more that you need to figure out, though. The purpose of them being in your life is to, you know, keep engaging and finding a way to keep understanding each other. Um, They have the potential to really just only really level up to just being a platonic friendship. But they but there's also a defined and genuine attraction. Y'all know who y'all really want to fuck with and who you don't. Y'all know the people who you would just like to. It wouldn't be it would be okay if these people are just friends and are not. You know that it happens all the time. I'm just telling you to be intentional about it. That's what your playmate is. And sex can also be something that you and your playmate have in common as well. Do your thing. Do your thing. You feel me? Then you have the contender. And the contender, the length of connection can be between two weeks to three months. Okay. Um, the current purpose is y'all have multitude. Y'all have a multitude of similar interests. There's genuine compatibility. There's also a growing sense of sensation of desire. There's this growing sensation of desire. And your intrigue and engagement is truly intuitive. Like you really genuinely want to learn more. You're really into it. You want you get you get a little excited when you want to chat with them. Right. Um, and I think one of the most important parts of the contender is that they are there to challenge the champion. They are there to challenge the champion in a real, real way. Now, when it comes to the champion, the length of connection can be a month to six months. There's somebody you really fucking with now. The current, I would say the purpose of that champion would be uh, they're leading in the charge in all areas. You probably are. You probably are already having sex and it's great. You already have a bunch of interest in the, and you love it. Y'all building, y'all communicating consistently. There's obvious sexual chemistry, obvious like desire, obvious intrigue, uh, consistent behavior and communication is truly developing and is being and it's, and it's just healthy. Right. If you had to choose anybody that you, 
that you needed to be with or had to be with right now, it would more than likely be the champion. But you want to continue to go through the seasons because I truly believe that we all should shouldn't just immediately be like, all right, let's lock in and lock lock it out. Now, if you feel moved to do that for your person and y'all really align like that, by all means, go crazy. But I think time and letting things marinate and, and, and really age is something that's necessary. Hence how shows like Love is Blind really don't work out for a lot of people, because a lot of people, they do need more time to get to know each other. They do need more exposure to each other to really understand that this is something they can do from a long term perspective. You need that time. You need to get that sample size of what is going to what it can possibly be like with each other before the stakes are as high as they can be. It relieves my anxiety. Just be intentional about it. We don't got to go with the flow. We don't got to waste a bunch of time. We don't have to look back six months from now and be like, what are we? We can be intentional about that. Be intentional. Um, but also they get got to show that they can actually stand up to the things. I don't think that it's, you know, I think that the people that you, I don't think the people that should, should know exactly what role they're playing, you know, and if this is a, you know, this is a strategy that you're going to do, they shouldn't know what their roles are. Treat people kindly. They don't have to seem like they are, you know, second and third and fourth choices, because honestly, you want people to feel good enough to rise to the occasion of anything. So make space for them to show up as they are and and be open to whatever they can potentially be, because your buffer could quickly become your champion. Your your contender can truly upstage your champion, your playmaker. But it that is really all you're trying to go for. That's really all it is. And I'm also not giving you putting the pressure on you to have all these people having them all in your life concurrently either. You might only have a, a contender and a champion sometimes. Maybe you only got a play made in the buffer sometimes and nobody is a, a clear champion. Don't force it, but certainly attempt to put those positions in play. You got to be intentional. So much of this strategy is uh, is truly about like, it's not just about dating for people. It's not about just creating this roster for the sake of just you know, creating this, just having a pool of people to choose from. It's truly about, I'm not trying to make this into a game for you. I want you to genuinely put yourself out there though. And this is goes to anybody who's hearing this. I'm making this very unisex idea because to me, I think everybody needs to approach it this way. I see a lot of men making particular decisions in dating where they end up wasting people's time, wasting their time, not having a clear vision and people get sucked into it without really being able to communicate exactly what it is. And all these things can genuinely be conversations. They should all everybody that you're dating should know that you're dating other people. If they have an issue or a problem with that, then they can't. They're, they're not even buffer status. <laughs> you're not going to date them at all. They're not OK with you dating other people. So that is how you should approach this. That is exactly what you should do. I believe that to really. I think that to really get all these things done, you need to be intentional. You have to put yourself out there. You can't be you can't be too introverted. If you want to intentionally date, you have to intentionally date. Go out, go do things, go do things that you would want your person to be doing too. meet meet them where they at. Lock into your interests, continue to keep working on you, fixing the things that you want to be, fixing the things that you want to do for you but also keeping yourself open for who who could be out there for you. That's simply what it is. That's all it is. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe in you. I know you can do it. Just do it. Now, let's send it on. Today, send it on is uh, yet again, another Braid. Shout out to Braid. Shout out to Mike and the team over at Braid. Um, In the description of this episode, you'll see a link where I give you the same prompt that I'm about to say to you now. And is, do you, and I want you to answer this prompt and respond to that Braid by just tapping that link and responding. Do you believe that you will find a long-term partner? Do you genuinely believe that you will find 
a long term partner. Um, attach this braid. You can reply via, you know, text, image, or video. I would love for you to do video. Understand if you do do video, I may repurpose the video. So that's just something that's just to let you know. But that's to send it on. Is do you believe that you will find a long term partner? Reason why I ask this question is because I think about the idea of the big alone all the time. Because I hear people talk about love as if it's something that maybe isn't for you, maybe isn't a part of your love, even part of your life journey and life story that you may have that you have to adjust and accept the idea that you may, quote unquote, live a life without finding that love. Um, And I don't think that's how that works. I don't think people should even accept that as a belief. Um, I think that we can use different language to understand the possibilities of life because it, that one always feels and sounds and is coded with so much morbid and, and dark and like negative language of like as if finding as if not having a certain type of love of your life is makes your life half as good. And I don't want to give that out ever to anybody, but that's to send it on. That's to send it on for tonight today's episode uh i appreciate you for locking in with me this is yet again another great 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 episode and i hope that you all enjoyed it you can follow me everywhere at kings underscore memoirs follow the podcast at simply king pod make sure you subscribe on all platforms that you've listened or watched the pod uh this is fun this is dope. Make sure you share this and give this out to the people. I appreciate you so much for giving me your time, even if it was just a little bit of time. Um, yeah, rock with me. Stick with me. Got a, even more great episodes coming out week after week after week. So lock in, lock in, lock in. This has been the Soulfully Conscious Podcast for Humans, Simply Being Humans. I've been Rodney Perry, also known as King, and this has been Simply King. Peace. <laughs>